Hi, and welcome to the Your Story Studios podcast, a podcast where we talk about all things content creation. And today on the show, we have Constantine, and today we are talking about the Lumix GH7. Tell me about it, Con. <laughs> Lumix, yeah. Um, so, look, I, I shoot the GH7 um, last few months, started with Lumix probably about seven or eight years ago, originally on the GH5, and I've got two GH6s, G9 II, and uh, yeah, now the GH7. So, yeah, loving filming with the GH7. That's a lot of micro four-thirds There is cameras. a lot. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, well, you know, I started initially when I got into filming, um, I had a budget from a, a manager said, We've got a budget. Go out and buy yourself, you know, a camera, a tripod, lights, a gimbal, and I had, you know, and I looked into it at the time, and you know, what you got for value for money, um, the Lumix, the Micro Four Thirds ecosystem was great at the time. The Ibis was amazing. I was doing a lot of handheld shooting, so I started off, you know, in the Micro Four Thirds, and you know, over the years, I've accumulated eight, nine, ten lenses that I'm now really stuck down this rabbit hole of. Micro Four Thirds lenses, but look, you know, I'm loving it. I know it has its limitations. I know, you know, the low light capability, obviously, compared to a full frame, but the flexibility you have in a range of different shooting environments, you know, um, handheld shooting, IBIS is amazing. Now with the GH7, you've got the Phase Detect autofocus. So that's one thing that I'm absolutely loving. For years, I'm just all manual focusing, which is fine and great. But for corporate work that I do, I do a lot of corporate um, interviews and just knowing that it's locked onto the eye and I'm doing multiple cameras on my own. So I can't always stand there at each camera knowing, is it in focus? Is it not? You know, you're relying on your screen. You know, it's great when you've got a, you know, Ninja V, Ninja 5 screen on that you can rely and see a little bit better. But having that phase detect autofocus and that eye detect like the Sony's, you know, you have the Sony's. You know, right up there now with the with the Sony autofocus, which is which is great. Yeah, well, well, talk us through your camera rig that you got here. You just mentioned you've got the Atomos Ninja Five. Um, what else can you talk us through, and why have you got each piece on this rig? Yeah, so you know, I've probably had this rig like this for you know a few years now. Um, obviously, the camera changes, um, and also I've got the XLR. 32-bit float recording device, which is an absolute game changer for audio. Yeah, so for to, people that don't know what 32-bit yeah. float is, explain it. So basically it's a recording device that you you don't really even have to change levels. You know, it doesn't peak. The, the floor and the ceiling of the audio file is almost infinite where you basically there is no level. So when you plug in an XLR mic, and I'm using, you know, a mic on an interview, boom mic, I plug it straight into um, the XLR device, which goes straight away into the camera. There is no levels. You don't have to adjust levels. You're not worried about peaking. Normally, you know, with interviews, you know, you're adjusting levels and then you go, yeah, everything's right. And you press record. And then they start laughing at a level that you hadn't planned before. The audio peaks, it distorts. You can't get that back no matter what you do. And you just have to live with it. You know, sometimes you might record a lav mic as a backup somewhere out of shot. I don't like to kind of have mics in shot where possible because it takes the viewer out of the video. If they can see a microphone where possible, I try not to show a lav mic. But, you know, you might have a, an extra mic as a backup that's at a different level just in case it, it, it you know, it peaks. But with a 32-bit recording device like the XLR unit on the GH7, um, directly straight in and it's, you know, powered also by the camera. So you don't have to worry about power. So I was using a Zoom um, F3 device, which is also 32-bit float, float, probably for the last couple of years. And it was on my rig just attached to the side, which was great, but, you know, it could run out of batteries. You know, it actually takes a lot of batteries when phantom power is generated. So phantom power is, you know, generating the power to a certain types of microphones. And um, just having this on, on the camera and not having to worry about it, plug it in, do your interview, and you don't have to worry. It's a yeah, complete game changer for me. So, yeah, loving that, that addition. I've just got a new handle that arrived this week as well. So I used to have the handle where this device was and I had to get a longer handle so I can fit the XLR unit and now I've got the handle, which is easier to carry around. And you mentioned there's limitations to the GH7. You mentioned low light um, and the sensor. Talk me through that. I'm a Sony shooter. Yep. I have... so. I'll admit I have used Micro Four Thirds. I've got a GH4 over there and a Panasonic AF100. So 
I am aware of micro four thirds and their um, limitations, but for our audience that might not understand the difference between sensors and all that, why would a micro four thirds sensor be viewed as a limitation? Yeah, so the sensor size um, in a micro four thirds camera is a lot smaller than a full frame. So, you know, you've got less light hitting the sensor and in low light conditions, um, you know, you, it might introduce a lot more noise if you're raising the ISO. So if you're trying to make the image brighter on your camera, you know, you, it might introduce, you know, artifacts and um, noise in, in your in your film. But I'm finding the latest camera, so like the GH7 that I'm using, I haven't really had a situation where I'm even seeing any noise. I'm, I'm not really shooting a lot in low light. You know, you've also got to take into, into, a fa- into account what type of filming you're doing, you know. I'm doing, you know, interviews, which which is a lot of controlled lighting. I'm doing outside sh- shooting, which is, you know, harsh sunlight. So I've got my ND filters. I'm doing events, but even there, they're well lit as well. So I'm not overly shooting in super, super low light situations. So I haven't really had that as a bit of a downside to my filming and my shooting with Micro Four Thirds. The lenses are generally a little bit cheaper than full frame lenses. Mind you, I do have the Leica lenses on all my lenses. So they're the most expensive lenses you can have on the camera and also the lowest aperture, so 1.7. So generally in a micro four thirds, a 1.7 in a full frame would be about a 3.4. So you're doubling the aperture in a full frame. So you're not quite getting as much bokeh um, separation from your subject to the background, which I know is a trade-off, but again, you know, you don't have to, again, what, what are you shooting? You know, for interviews, you kind of want a little bit of the background. Sometimes you don't want always be so blurry. So it's not an issue for me. Um, you know, I have thought about going the S52X route and full frame and I'm, you know, I was close to going that way as well, but I'm so heavily invested in the micro four thirds lenses that that's, you know, it, to change up everything is a big investment. So I think at some stage, either I'll have a, a, a full frame camera to accompany my micro four thirds or start to transition to full frame. I, I understand the benefits, but I am where I am at the moment with my micro four thirds lenses. So yeah, continuing down that route at the moment. Yeah. And can you talk mm. me through um, perhaps like a recent shoot that you've used this camera on? Have you found that there's been any um, limitations that you're like, oh, I really should have got a full frame camera? Not, not really, you know, mainly for interviews, I'll do two cameras set up. So I've got the GH7 as my main rig, which I've got here. And then generally I have a second camera and I'm using the Lumix G92. So they've both got the new phase detect autofocus in both those cameras. The first camera with that phase detect autofocus was the G92 and that was a year or so ago. And that was the first, you know, time that I actually had some decent autofocus. Like I, I hadn't in the past and the GH5 and the GH6, they're great cameras, you know, the color science is amazing. I love the colors I get out of it. IBIS is great, but I could not rely. And I never used it, the autofocus in that camera. There's a button um, that I can punch in and it will lock on, you know, when I'm filming manual, it'll, it'll lock on to the subject, you know, using autofocus, but I could never rely on it continuous. So continuously knowing where the subject is, I would never trust it. I never used it like that. But the G92 was my main camera, which is the first camera I got with the autofocus. But I found that some of the buttons, so I, was, I went from a GH6 to a G92 and some of the buttons, like there was a, there's a record button at the front on the left that's really handy. So when I've got my camera rig, I can sometimes press it with my left hand or my right hand. The screen doesn't tilt like the, GH, the, the G92 screen doesn't tilt. So when I had that rig and I was going low for a shot, I couldn't actually tilt it up and it, was, it just had a few limitations. So as soon as the GH7 came out, I had the same features of this GH6, but with the autofocus, um, improved autofocus, that was a no-brainer for me. So now, yeah, I'm I'm shooting on, I'm still on micro four thirds, but with a, two cameras now with that phase detect autofocus, which is is a game changer for reliability. Um, and I'm and you, you know you just turn it on and turn it off when you need to as well. So for example, if you're racking focus, you're doing a shot behind a wall, you know, the autofocus is not on. Like I'm using manual, I'm still racking focus for, for majority of handheld stuff, but it's to know it's there is, yeah, it's great. And with the lenses that you've yeah. got, so you mentioned you've got the more expensive yeah, yeah, lenses. Yeah. Are you happy with the image quality that you're getting out of those? Yeah, 100%. So, you know, I used to use Metabone's adapter, so, um, and Canon EF lenses. So for people that don't know, an EF mount lens would not fit on a micro four thirds camera. You need an adapter um, like a Metabone's or a Viltrox that will convert it from a micro four thirds body 
to an EF Canon mount lens and I was using the Sigma 18 and 35 1.8 art lens. Which Classic is, lens. Uh, every, yeah, it was, it was kind of the go-to. GH5, 18 and 35 art, 1.8 was the go-to kind of, you know, handheld rigging, you know, a few years ago. And it was amazing. But I was just finding that on shoots, clients were asking for photos as well, as well as video. And when I switched to photos, the meta bones I found just, you know, wasn't locking on as fast as I'd like, but I, I love the shallow depth of field. So when I'm on a meta bones adapter, when it's a 1.8, it's equivalent to about a 1.1, 1.2 kind of depth of field. And then you doubled it for a full frame. So you know, it's 2.2, 2.4 kind of equivalent. So it's a pretty, pretty shallow depth. Whereas this is a 1.7 native and it can't go any lower than that. So, you know, I, I sacrificed depth of field but now with the Leica lenses, and I've got Leica lenses on all the cameras. So I've got the 10 to 25 1.7 and the 25 to 50 1.7 Leica on both of the, my main cameras. And I've also got the nine millimeter Leica that are on my third GH6, like for gimbal shots, wide establishing sort of shots that I use. Yeah, definitely the quality in the Leica lenses is just like second to none. It's, it's literally the best lenses you can get. And just having that consistency with the camera, the lenses, and I've also got the same Peter McKinnon ND polarizer, plus mist filter on the, all the lenses as well, which is an investment, but I had different ND filters on different lenses before. And the, just the, well, actually I had a matte box. I had the Vaxxas um, drop-in filters, the circle, the circular matte box, um, the circular filters. So I had the, you know, I had a variable one, I had standard ones, I had blue streak and I had all these different, and the matte box, you know, it looks cool. And, you know, you go into a shoot and you're like, oh, you got a matte box. You know, you must you're, be legit. Real, yeah, yeah, it'll look good. But the reality was also with the matte box, I found because it was so deep, because it could actually take two or three drop-in filters, which was amazing. So you could stack, you know, an ND, you could stack a, a blue streak so it kind of looked like an anamorphic kind of lens flare, even though it's not an anamorphic lens. And, you know, you can put in your mist filter. So I could actually stack like two or three in there, which is great. But because the matte box was so thick, it actually had a bit of vignetting from, so for that's a 10 to 25, so probably from 10 to 12 to 13, you could start, you could see the vignetting. So then I always had to punch into like 12 or 13. So then I'm losing a few millimeters of width and I'm like, I just didn't like that. Um, and also I didn't have the matte box on the other cameras. So then there wasn't consistency in the color shift in all the lenses. So at one point, you know, a few months ago, I went, I've, I've got to just suck this up and get, the high quality ND filters on all the lenses and all the cameras. So there's consistency there. So I've moved across to that and yeah, have a look back there. It's great to have that. Yeah. Excellent. You mentioned that you've got the mist filter. What yeah. are your thoughts on the mist filters? Uh, I use the, I think it's a one eighth on all of them. So it's really minimal. You can almost can't, can't even see them. I've also got the moment cine bloom one eighth, a uh, one eighth and one quarter as well. So, and I can stack them on, top of that as well or behind that. So if I want the to bloom the highlights, you know, a little bit more, I've got that flexibility. But I kind of like, you know, cameras are so digital, so crisp. They're all, it's almost too sharp now. So I've always loved that just slight blooming of the highlights with a mist filter just to take the edge off bright lights and, you know, sky and sunlight and so forth. So you can hardly notice it, but there's, there's a bit of something, it's like a special source, I guess. So like you can't really put your finger on it. It's just enough to give it that kind of beautiful look to an image, but without it looking like, oh, yeah, he's using a bloom or a, you know, um, a mist filter on it. So, yeah, yeah, it's subtle enough. Yeah. yeah. I use mist filters. I use the Tiffin Black Pro Mist yeah, yeah, ones, yeah. one eighth. Yeah. And yeah, one eighth is a good, good. Yeah. I, they pretty much live on my lenses. Yeah, They're on here. all yeah. the lenses here yeah. right now. The only downside, um, there's two downsides. So flaring sometimes when I'm doing yeah, okay. um, maybe like a music shoot or whatever and there's other lights um, or there's lots of lights or whatever, um, sometimes there'll be some flaring uh, in the image. And then also I do a bit of corporate stuff where they walk in front of big uh, LED screens and because that's a light source and they're walking in front of it, there's a little bit of blooming around the edges which – I'm not a massive fan of. So yeah. I have learned from experience that, uh, like, and the client hasn't said anything about it or said what's wrong with the image. And it's not enough to make you go, oh, this image is not usable or anything like that. But it's just something that I'm like, oh, I should probably take the mist filter off. And then you get a yeah. bit of a sharper, crisper image, which 
um, doesn't need to look so cinematic. Yeah, I, actually, one of the reasons why I did switch was when you're shooting in backlit. There's a there's a there's a, a big window behind a subject, and you have to shoot into it. It's alive. It's it's not you know something you can control. I did notice that on the person using the filter that I was using, it was kind of like giving this weird doubling effect, like you said. But on these Peter McKinnon ones, I haven't noticed that at all. So it's yeah. something, I don't know if it's the filter or the quality of the filter, but, um, you know, sometimes you, get, you pay for it. You get their expensive uh, ND filters, but yeah, they're worth it. Yeah, excellent. And also I have a question about your Ninja 5. Why a Ninja 5 and do you use it for its recording features? <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, I, I, it's always running. It's always recording as a backup. I rarely actually pull the footage. So I've got a um, one terabyte SSD recording at all times. So CF Express card in the GH7 and I am running recording on an SSD with the Ninja as well. I primarily use it so I can see that A, it's recording. So it has the big screen. That is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> and also like if I've got it on my shoulder, that's kind of what you're seeing as well. So I've pushed it at a distance where I can still see it. And also, you know, obviously it's a bigger screen. You can see when things are in focus. I do use the false colors on the screen as well. So if I'm doing an interview, I do try and get the IRE levels right when I'm filming an interview and I do swipe, swipe across to, um, so there are, you know, extra video editing, video tool, assistance tools that in camera might not, you know, every camera doesn't have, um, but the Ninja is great for that but you've just got to make sure I've once on a client, I had a, a horror show where there, for whatever reason, there was an output from the camera. It was showing all the display on the, on the Ninja. And at that time, early on in my day, I was actually only recording on the Ninja for some reason. I wasn't recording on the camera and I'd burnt in all the display, the leveler, everything on the Ninja. And I'm like, oh, that's all right. Everything's going to be there. Got back and that was all the footage and it was unusable. So you just got to be careful that you're recording on the camera and the Ninja, not just the Ninja. And also that it's not recording and burning in the display from the camera into the Ninja. So yeah, tip for young young players there. Don't do what I did. That is you know, very helpful. <laughs> you learn your lesson. You do something once. Like, you know, every you learn from every shoot, right? So every time you, you go to a shoot, there's something that goes wrong, right? Like a little thing, hopefully nothing goes wrong in a perfect world, but there's always something you learn from and I learned pretty quickly on that. I'll never be doing that again, but yeah. Um, yeah, Ninja's great, um, but I don't always use the footage. It's really just a, you know, a, a tool to help me in to film. Excellent. And is there any other key features that the GH7 has that you'd like to mention before we wrap up the episode? You know, look, it's probably packed with a lot of features that I don't always use, like, you know, ProRes RAW internal, we can do that. I don't have a need to shoot RAW. The file sizes are huge. It's there if I ever want to. If I've got like a, you know, a commercial corporate shoot, I'm going, hang on, every second of footage needs to be, at, you know, I'll be able to adjust the white balance, you know, in post. I try and get all that um, correct, you know, before shooting, but it's, it's there if I need it. Open gate's a great feature. Um, so I've had that in the GH6. So I've had that for, you know, a few years now already. I know a lot of people are starting to potentially switch. I saw a YouTube a video recently of someone who's a Sony shooter and all suits Sony Sony um has moved to this S5 2X because of open gate really and to have so open gate for people who don't know it's basically shooting in the full size of the sensor so uh, four by three in camera you can create markers to shoot vertical um, and obviously you know you've got your markers for your 16 by nine but what it allows you to do is shoot once and you don't have to shoot you don't have to turn my camera around for vertical and oh, now we're going to shoot for reels and now I'm going to shoot for widescreen YouTube you can shoot once and just make sure that you've got your back enough and you've got a far enough image that you're wide enough that you can have um, vertical shots and wide shots and you're not cropping for vertical and you're losing that headspace, headroom for your shots. So, yeah, I, I use open gate all the time, but you can only shoot at 25. You can't do, you know, 50 frames open gates. It's the only limitation on open gate. As long as you're shooting at 25 frames per second, it's fine. Uh, I'm not changing anytime soon. Um, the S5 2X is tempting me. But I'm really trying not to spend on gear lately. Like, you know, cameras can come and go. Lenses, you know, obviously if you, if you invest well, you don't have to keep upgrading if you've got good quality glass. So I'd say out there, make sure your glass is good and, you know, your cameras can come and go. But, yeah, loving shooting on the GH7 and would highly recommend it for someone who's doing a range of shooting, loves good IBIS, great autofocus now in the camera, the 32-bit float XLR device here. 
amazing for audio. Um, yeah, great all-round camera. Excellent. Well, I think that was a very good sales pitch for anyone that might be thinking <laughs> of getting a, a GH7. Excellent. Well, thank you, Constantine, for joining us on the Your Story Studios podcast and telling us all about your GH7. Thanks for having me.